What's up, Fight fans? You're listening to The Neutral Corner, episode number 129. I am Michael Montero for BoxingMonthly.com and Boxing Monthly Magazine. Before we get into news and notes, we got a lot of news and notes to cover this week, guys. Want to give a quick shout out to Thomas Savage for joining us on Patreon. Thank you so much, Savage, you the man. And I wanted to remind you guys to check us out on Patreon, patreon.com slash Montero Unboxing. Also go to Apple Podcast and find the Neutral Corner Podcast. Subscribe, drop a rating, review, spread the word. If you guys are interested in an MOB t-shirt, shoot me an email, MonteroOnboxing at gmail.com. All right, guys, let's get right into the news and notes. We got plenty to discuss. Okay, so first and foremost, let's talk briefly about Deontay Wilder and Anthony Joshua. So the talks, and I'm using air quotes as I say that, the talks between the two camps have broken down. And they've announced that they're going to move in different directions. And basically, what I've been telling you guys, and I'm not the only one for the record, there's plenty of us out there who have been telling you guys, shooting it straight, that these two are not going to fight until 2019. And I made a little trolling video last week with a god-awful British slash Australian accent. I don't know what the hell that was. Uh, imitating Eddie Hearn. Just kind of trolling and making fun of the whole thing because this, no shit. Anthony Joshua is going to fight Alexander Povetkin. Deontay Wilder is going to fight Dominic Brazil. Uh, told you guys a while ago, Dominic Brazil has been in training talking about his people have told him he's fighting Wilder next. So him and his people knew what was going on and they were going to fight Wilder. Nobody else in the media talked to him. So I just, look, Deontay Wilder is friends with some guys at some YouTube channels. They sit around and chat and they make quotes. It's not that different from what Mikey Garcia has kind of been doing over the last couple years. But as it relates specifically to this situation with Wilder and Joshua, of course, Joshua and Eddie Hearn, they have ties to some YouTube platforms over in the UK. And these guys do their little chats, their little conversations, and some people pick it up as headlines on some of the more uh, more esteemed boxing news sites, if you will. And this stuff gets promoted as headlines. And, and look, I don't mind, and I totally understand boxing fans wanting to banter back and forth about this potential super fight. That's what sports fans do. It's not just in boxing. It's in every sport. Look at the LeBron James situation, right? He just announced over the weekend, it finally was you know, revealed that he's gonna go to the Los Angeles Lakers of the NBA. But weeks before that, after he lost in the NBA Finals, everybody's been speculating, right? And there's been all these blogs and all this web traffic on social media and all that talking about where is LeBron gonna go? That's what sports fans do. So I don't mind that. What annoys me is filtering through all the news that I have to go through to do a show like this and then other assignments I'm working on for Boxing Monthly Mag or one of the other platforms I work with. And I gotta sift and, and filter through all the noise, all the clickbait, all the bullshit of something that everybody in the business that's been around and knows how the business works and is actually talk to people off the record, like Dominic Brazil, for example, knowing that him and Wilder were going to fight this summer. And, and both fighters, they already know that's happening next too. For us, you know, most of us are just ignoring the noise and trying to go about our work, but other people are contributing to the noise and profiting off of it. That's what kind of annoys me. I understand it. It just annoys me a little bit. In the end, look, if I could choose... And, you know, I get accused of saying, oh, I'm supporting this fight, marinating. And, but no, I'm just telling you guys that's the way it is. If I could choose, I would have AJ and Wilder fight right now. I'd have them fight in New York. So I could take a 90-minute flight up there and go see them fight. But that's not what's going to happen. This is the exact same process. Well, not exact same, but it mirrors the process of Canelo Golovkin. Go back to late 2015. When Canelo beat Cotto, and Canelo was already a star, he was already a name, but he was fighting one of the other top names or stars in the sport, well faded and past his prime, but Miguel Cotto was still a name, a top, probably third biggest name 
at that time, third or fourth biggest name in American boxing that was actually active. And he fought him to, that was basically a brand building legacy kind of fight for him. And yeah, he grabbed a title, the middleweight title technically. And through that, he inherited that mandatory Gennady Golovkin. That's the fight everybody wanted to see. Everybody knew that that was going to be the biggest challenge out there for Canelo. But Golden Boy and Canelo, they sat down and chopped it up and whacked up the numbers. And they looked at, look, man, there's a potential two or three fight series with Golovkin here. But to do that, we got to build this thing up. So what did they do? They built it up for 18 months before they finally fought. And when they finally did fight, Last September, actually it was more than 18 months of buildup, but approximately a year and a half. When they did finally fight, it was a much bigger event. And as it turned out, a better fight than I think it would have been at the beginning of 2016. So Canelo was the more established star. His side took their time. They even dumped the title to take their time to eventually fight Golovkin. And now what? We got a rematch coming up. Depending on what happens there, maybe there's a third fight. Even if there isn't, you get two fights more than one. So if you are, forget about Wilder's side for a second. Just take it over to AJ's side and Hearn's side. They're sitting in that Canelo seat. They're the name, right? And they're actually the much bigger name in this case than Canelo was more than Golovkin. Now, in terms of dollars and cents... Canelo was the A plus side and, and, and Golovkin was the B side, right? But in terms of hardware, Golovkin had all the titles. In terms of putting butts in seats, Golovkin, Canelo does as well. But let's not forget, Golovkin was the B side there, but he sold out arenas in multiple jurisdictions, Los Angeles, New York. He set merchandise sales records at multiple venues. He went over and fought Brooke, and that was a massive crowd. So he had numbers, and he had an established brand, at least, to bring to the table against Canelo Alvarez. And that's why he got 30% for the first fight, even though Canelo, by far, a bigger moneymaker than Anthony Joshua. So you take all this to the Joshua Wilder situation. And I think that this is A plus B minus. It might even be A plus C plus in terms of name recognition and everything else. It's not exactly the same as Canelo Golovkin because, again, Golovkin the B-side, but he had a lot he was bringing to the table. Deontay Wilder brings nothing to the table other than being the number two heavyweight right now, being the top challenger to Anthony Joshua. People are interested in seeing that fight. But let's look at this. You're Joshua. You're the A-side. You could do massive, massive crowds fighting anybody, in your home country, you have all the hardware except for, yeah, uh, Wilder has one title. But you, are, you, have all, you have unified titles. You have the hardware. You fought the better opposition. You fought the last name in the division. That was Vladimir Klitschko. Again, I go back and mirror the Canelo Cotto fight. That, now, it wasn't the same kind of fight. That was more of a dull fight, but it was a brand building, almost a past torching or torch passing type of thing even more so with Joshua and Klitschko because Joshua and Klitschko was actually a great fight one of the best heavyweight fights we've seen in decades and that was a true passing of the torch the last great heavyweight post Lennox Lewis Joshua beat him in more emphatic and exciting fashion than Tyson Fury who has been linked to performance enhancing drugs beat Klitschko so Again, when I'm talking A-B side here, guys, it mirrors the Golovkin and Canelo situation in certain ways. But then in other ways, AJ is a bigger potential future brand in a much bigger A side, B side scenario than what we saw with Canelo Golovkin. If you're Eddie Hearn, let, let's say you guys out there actually believe the $50 million offer from Wilder, which was bullshit. And by the way, Hearn's offers to Wilder were bullshit. They were every bit as much bullshit as Golden Boy's original flat fee offer to Golovkin back in what 2016 was. And some of the offers that uh, uh, Floyd Mayweather flat fee to Manny Pacquiao was making when he stalled and delayed that fight the last few years. The first few years that was on Manny, but the last few years it was 100% on Floyd. 
if let's say you believe that $50 million offer. If you are Eddie Hearn and you are Joshua, Anthony Joshua's team, you're sitting back and you're like, 50 million is shit. We're looking at 500 million. We want to build this thing up to a two or three fight series. One of which of those fights with Wilder, the first one will be in the UK next spring or summer. And I think Joshua will win a decision that is disputed and argued by some fans, particularly American fans and some of the YouTube amateur media, quote unquote, people that have popular YouTube channels here that are friends with Wilder and his handlers. They'll debate the decision. That will be the first fight. That second fight is going to go to Las Vegas. It's, it's possible the first fight will go there, guys. But definitely one of the two fights, there will at least be two fights between these guys, will go to Las Vegas. Eddie Hearn wants to build a brand there. Remember, they're building an NFL football stadium there because that NFL team just moved there. He's thinking long term. He's thinking 50 million ain't shit. We're talking 500 million. We want to build a brand here and make it a long lasting brand. They're thinking long game. Now, am I being a shill for Eddie Hearn and Anthony Joshua? No, I'm just telling you guys the business. And that is the biggest reason why this fight will not happen this year. AJ and Wilder not fighting this year. I'd love to be proven wrong. But they don't want to go up against the biggest event of the year, which is Canelo Golovkin 2. And even as, as close as six weeks after that is going to affect their promotion. Outside of the UK, nobody knows who the hell Anthony Joshua is except for diehard boxing fans. No casual fans know who Anthony Joshua is once you leave the UK. Fact. Nobody anywhere, no casual fans anywhere know who the hell Deontay Wilder is in any market. He's not even a big brand in Alabama where there's no sports in his home state of Alabama. It's just a college sports state because there's no pro sports. He should be selling 30,000 tickets at fights there, and he doesn't. I don't think he's ever done more than 15,000. Good crowd. He's a regional draw, but he's not, doing so, he's not doing amazing things there. He's not setting records in Alabama, and, and he should be. So... All things considered, guys, it's going to build, okay? Now, let's move on to some upcoming fights. Apparently, Pacquiao Matisse, the investors, the finances have come through, and apparently the fight is going to happen. So we'll see in a couple weeks. The officials, the actual ring officials have been chosen. So it looks like we're going to get Manny Pacquiao, Lucas Matisse, which I think is going to be a fun matchup. Look, five years ago, Pacquiao, even five years ago, I thought Pacquiao was finished. He was past his best. I shouldn't say finished. He was, pa he was finished as a pound for pound possible top two or three level fighter. But even five years ago, I think he would have mopped the floor with Matisse. Just mopped the floor with the guy. But now he's so badly faded. Matisse is rejuvenated and hungry again. He needs money. Um, he's got dynamite in his fist as well. So I think this might be a, a fun fight. I think it's going to be uh, interesting to see how both guys look. So looking forward to that one. Also, Bryant Jennings. He's been bounced around as a potential name for several fights. Well, finally, they've settled on a fight for him. Alexander Dimitrenko. Big, tall heavyweight. Uh, you know, well past his best, but he's been in there with some of the bigger names. Really, I think over like the past decade. I think that's a good fight for Brian Jennings. And that's going to be on ESPN on August 18th. That's going to be at the brand new Ocean Resort Casino in Atlantic City. I think this is going to be the first boxing event there. And also Jesse Hart, who is another Philly dude. Remember, Brian Jennings is a Philly dude. So is Jesse Hart. He's going to be in a co-main. No doubt some of those guys from Philly, the Philly fans are going to make the trip. It's not that far from Philly over to AC to, uh, to watch that fight. So I think that's going to be a fun little card on ESPN. Nice little doubleheader to keep things rolling along in the dog days of summer. Also, WBC purse bid happened uh, uh, last week. Adonis Stevenson, or maybe it was early. No, it was last week. It was last week. Adonis Stevenson, Alexander Gavashtik. So the winning bid was put up by Stevenson's side, Yvonne Michelle. They put up 2.1 million. Top rank was 
at number two, I don't know if anyone else came anywhere near close to those two. Top rank put up 1.6 million, and obviously they represent Kvajdik. So it's won by Michelle. That means it's going to Canada, and it's very likely going to be on Showtime, which Top Rank says no big deal, not a problem. Because you remember, uh, Gavage Dick, you know, is part of that top rank deal on ESPN. But I don't think that he's locked in. I think that uh, part of the deal with that ESPN contract with top rank is in situations like this, you can bounce outside of it. No big deal. So uh, Gavage Dick isn't burning a bridge or anything like that. This will almost certainly go to Showtime and it will absolutely be in Canada. It's just either Montreal or Toronto. So the way this purse bid thing works, Stevenson is getting 65%, about 1.3 million. Kvajdik is getting 35%, a little over 700,000. Uh, the purse splits, they vary depending on the sanctioning organization, but generally speaking, they're around 65, 35. So, you know, Stevenson, for a guy who's been a champion for so long and going up uh, fighting perhaps the best opponent, the best defense, since he's won the light heavyweight title, and he's only getting 1.3 million. Now I know there's going to be some additional money coming in, but it's going to be minimal. Uh, I don't think it's, I don't think it's going to clear two million for this fight. It's uh, it says a lot, man. It, it says a lot. Light heavyweight is a division that has a lot of talent, but because the top names have not fought each other consistently enough, you don't have one big superstar. You had a guy in Andre Ward who kind of had a good deal for himself with Rock Nation, swooped in and used the guy to make a lot of money and then bounced out. But he was by no means a superstar. This division is dying for one. But these guys all got to fight each other. So hopefully this fight is the beginning of that process. And I think based on, look, neither one of these guys has looked spectacular lately. I just think there's more upside with Gavajdik, who I do believe fights down to the level of his opposition to a degree. He's got a little bit of Gilberto Ramirez in him, in that sense. I think he's going to be more up for this fight. And I just think his angles and his sharpness, as long as his chin holds up in the early rounds against Stevenson, and Gavajdik has been dropped. Every time he's been dropped, though, he's responded well. But if he could survive some of those bombs from Stevenson coming from the southpaw stance, it, it, the more rounds this thing goes, I lean towards Gavajdik. And I think it's, it's very, very possible he could stop Stevenson late. All right, one more fight I'll talk about, and then we'll move on to the next subject. Oleksandr Usyk, Murat Gassiev. And I talked about this last week, but it's just it's been made official this week. Tickets are on sale July 21st, Olympic Stadium in Moscow. They sold 7,000 tickets in the first day. I think it's over 10,000 tickets they've sold already. This is going to be a hot, hot ticket. It's going to be an electric atmosphere there in Russia. I cannot freaking wait to watch this fight. This is the best matchup of the year to date. Make no mistake about it. And I'm going to say it again for the 500th time. This is the biggest fight in the history of the cruiserweight division, which is 39 years old. The winner of this fight, depending on how it plays out, we got to see what happens. But the winner of this fight, if they're decisive in their victory, they completely clean out the cruiserweight division, all the titles. They are the winner, the first winner of any World Boxing Super Series tournament, period. So the first one to do that, that puts them on record. And that World Boxing Super Series, guys, that's going to go for at least five years. I'll talk more about that in a second. But um, it's a big deal. It's a very, very big deal. And they are a pound-for-pound -pound player. A lot of people have Usyk right on the bubble right now if they're pound-for-pound -pound top 10. I know at Boxing Monthly, we bounce that around at Ring Magazine. We bounce that around. I'm on the ratings committees for both of those platforms. And um, I rate them right there around number nine or 10, pound for pound. And I include, of course, the vast amateur pedigree, much like guys like Guillermo Rigondeau, uh, Vasil Lomachenko, Gennady Golovkin. I bumped them up even when they didn't have as many fights because I included the amateur pedigree with their professional accomplishments. Now, if Usyk wins this fight and wins it big, he might be a top five pound for pound player. You could say the same thing for Gassiev. He doesn't have the amateur pedigree to add to his accomplishments, but cleaning out a whole division and doing it in decisive fashion, that's pound for pound, ladies and gentlemen. So I cannot wait to see that damn fight. World Boxing Super Series. I was just talking about that. 
Season 2 is coming together. And we already know that we're going to have a tournament uh, featuring Bantamweights. We're going to have junior welterweights. And we've had some good young names enter that tournament. Josh Taylor just entered that tournament. He's the early favorite at 140 pounds, right? And they're saying there's going to be a third division. It's TBA right now. There's a, you know rumors. I'm not going to get into any of the rumors, but there is a third division that's going to be added. So the season two is going to have not two, but three tournaments. And I think there's going to be like 21 total fights or something like that. And it's supposed to start in September. But the biggest news related to World Boxing Super Series is they just signed a three-year deal with DAZN. So... <clears throat> So we talked about the zone a lot recently, right, with Eddie Hearn's deal. And look, if you're getting the World Boxing Super Series and they have three tournaments this season, and it's a three-year deal specifically with the World Boxing Super Series, that means it's going to be around for a while. It's been so successful internationally, at least over in Europe. Hasn't been as successful over here because nobody knows who these guys are because they're not fighting on American TV. But the zone. If that platform gets building up more and more and more, that will go a long way to building up those names and those tournaments with American fight fans here. It gives you guys a way to watch these fights. So I've talked about the pricing for the zone, which is going to be 20 something dollars a month. You compare that to the ESPN Plus app, it's a lot more, right? So you're going to have to get a lot more, uh, lot more uh, entertainment. A lot more just to, you know, f to live up to that price. Losing my train of thought here. But just, you know, if you're talking 20 bucks a month, you got to have a lot of action on there that justifies paying that, right? Well, this deal is pretty damn sweet. And it goes a long way to starting to justify that potential cost. So more details to come. But for right now, I love that Josh Taylor is in that 140-pound tournament. Regis Progray is not going to go in. Um... Jose Carlos Ramirez is not going to go in, but Josh Taylor will. So I don't know how that's going to affect the WBC situation I talked about last week. We'll see. But for right now, he's the early favorite, man. All right, one last item here on news and notes. Golden Boy Promotions and Nate Events are launching a series on Facebook. It's going to be on Facebook Watch in the USA. I'm not exactly sure what the hell Facebook Watch is. You guys will have to educate me on that. I believe it's just Facebook, just regular streaming on Facebook. And it will be around the world on Golden Boy Promotions website. So if you're not in America, you can catch these fight cards right off Golden Boy's website. So if you have access to the internet, you're gonna get to watch these cards. And this is a Golden Boy Promotions series, but they're doing it in association with Main Events, which I love because Main Events is out of the East Coast, Golden Boy Promotions, obviously out of Los Angeles. So you have the potential here to do some fight cards in different markets. They're not just going to be out of Los Angeles, which those Belasco cards are. So um, that's cool for the LA fight fans and everything, and you got to keep them happy. That's the big fight scene in America. But why not go to some other markets and get some of those fighters some exposure as well? So you have a, a West Coast and an East Coast promoter working together in partnership. I, I think they already have plans for a card in Pennsylvania. From what I've heard, I don't have details on that yet, but I think that's going to happen. The first card in this series starts August 11th when Jesus Rojas will defend his WBA featherweight title against Joseph Diaz Jr. at the Avalon in Hollywood. That's the same venue that Tom Loeffler is putting on his Wednesday night cards. Joseph Diaz, of course, coming off his first pro loss to Gary Russell Jr., gets right back into a title shot against Rojas. He has a really good chance to win that fight. The WBA, you know, that title's in 5,000 pieces. So is it really, really a title shot? You know, we could debate all that, but technically it is for a piece of the WBA featherweight title. So real quickly, a little rant on streaming apps and sites. I've talked, I feel like over the past couple months, a lot about the ESPN Plus app, the zone. I've talked about the tops and boxing cards, obviously, because I've been a part of those promotions. I've talked about the uh, 360 Hollywood Fight Night series. I've been a part of those, right? Guys, these streaming fight cards are changing the way boxing is getting back to the people. For years, for years, 
promoters, at least in the United States, have been fighting over TV dates. You had two venues, to, two platforms, I should say, to go through. You had HBO and you had Showtime. There's only so many Saturday nights a year that they're not premiering some new TV show or some movie or something, and there's an open date for a fight card. And then you got to get the right venue. You got to put it all together. You were at the mercy of the networks, the premium cable networks. That is being taken away. Promoters are taking the power back with these streaming systems, these streaming platforms, these apps, whether it's on an app or a site, the promoter has the power. They find a venue and they can f use whatever date they want. And if it's a small club show and you're just trying to get some, some of your new guys, some exposure and stuff, you could go anywhere. You could do a club level show on any date. Again, Tom Loeffler is doing Wednesday night. You have a lot of these guys doing cards on Friday nights like Thompson Boxing does. And several of these, uh, well, Golden Boy Promotions, the, the Friday night cards at Belasco. We've seen several fighters who grew up on those sorts of cards who have gone on to challenge for titles and some have won titles. Look at Daniel Roman with, uh, with Thompson Boxing, who most recently fought on Showtime. So these guys are, are taking the power back and making the cable premium cable networks and their, their uh, you know, TV dates, the fighting over that and bidding for that, they're making that irrelevant. And I love it. And it's taking boxing back to the people. I say it's going back to its roots. And yeah, you go back 100 years ago, a smartphone and an app did not exist. I don't mean in that sense. I mean figuratively. Coming back to the people. Right now, the people are on smartphones, tablets, apps, social media. That's where people are. And boxing's going there. Before, look at, just think 100 years ago and think of how many fights were on the radio. How many fights were broadcast on the radio and people would listen to live boxing on the radio? That was the technology of the time. Then when it got to TV and then when it got to premium cable and then it started to go to pay-per-view and I really blame Bob Arum and Don King for that the most in the United States. They were the ones who really, really presided over that movement here in America more than anybody else and probably worldwide more than anybody else. They are the two biggest culprits of that. But now it's coming back to the people. Modern day radio is social media. It's Facebook. It's Twitter. It's the apps on your phone, whether you got the Android or you got the iPhone, whatever the hell it is. You got the Apple TV. You could stream something and boom, bounce it over to your big screen 70 inch TV. There was a time where, you know, a 60 inch TV cost you thousands of freaking dollars. Now you can go to Costco and buy that shit for $500. And you can have live boxing from Russia, from Mexico, from Panama, from Japan, wherever, watching it in crystal clear you know, uh, picture on your TV. It's streaming off your phone. It's freaking amazing. So you have a bigger potential fan base that you're building internationally. And that is, I think, the, the end game, the long game with this whole thing. Because some people might think, well, why are you streaming something on Facebook or on your website? Who cares if some kid in Calcutta is watching your fight card? He's not going to buy the pay-per-view. Because, guys, 10 years from now, the pay-per-view ain't going to be on HBO. The pay-per-view, well, Showtime doesn't even do pay-per-view, but it's not going to be on TV. The pay-per-view is going to be on Golden Boy Promotions' website, which they've already done a couple times, right? But that's going to be where you watch the fight. That is the future of media. The pay-per-view pay might be on YouTube TV or something like that. It might be on Netflix. I don't know. Wh whatever replaces Netflix. But that's the future. So that kid in Calcutta who's watching for free on Facebook right now, and he's 15 and he ain't got no damn money, well, maybe in 28 years when he's an IT tech working at some firm and he's making pretty decent money, he can buy the pay-per-view. Pay-per-views by then will probably be $200 but you can buy the $200 pay-per-view right off Golden Boy's website or YouTube TV or whatever the hell it is. That is the long game here. So these guys are finally starting to get it. I love it. Box is coming back to the people. And if you look at fight cards themselves, where they're at, we're getting less Casino Vegas fights. We're getting more hometown fights. I'm going to talk about in the review portion coming up, a hometown fight card. 
where a, an action star was born. We got another hometown fight card coming up this weekend. We're seeing more and more of that, bringing boxing to the people. They're starting to figure it out again, guys, because they almost killed off this sport in America totally. It was an endangered species. It's still on the endangered list. Don't get me wrong. It's still on the endangered list, but it's no longer an endangered species. It's flourishing again. 10 years from now or 20 years from now, it's never going to be mainstream, especially the, with the way American politics are going now. It's never going to be mainstream, but it's not going to be an endangered species. It's going to flourish. All right, let's get into the review of what happened last week. Last Friday, June 29th in Cancun, Mexico, it was Golden Boy Promotions on ESPN. And in the main event, Rashidi Ellis wins a unanimous decision over 10 rounds over Alberto Mosquera, who was, uh, came into the fight undefeated, but against woeful opposition. And it was a decisive win for Ellis, but it was very, very boring. Ellis is very inconsistent in his performances. And I'm just seeing a pattern with some of these guys coming up. I understand sometimes you want to look good uh, tomorrow, win today, look good tomorrow. I get it. But unless you have some sort of ethnic fan base built in or, or something like a power promoter behind you, which Ellis does, but he doesn't fit into Golden Boy Promotions typical demographic packaging, if you catch my drift. Um, Ellis, look, man, you got to have a little more consistency in your performances. You go back to March, he had a TKO four win over Fidel Munoz. That was an exciting, explosive performance. And I get it, styles make fights. And he was decisive in this win over Mosquera, who, who had some experience, but it just was dull. It, it was not an entertaining type of fight that makes people wanna see this, this young kid again. Now you go back before uh, this March, you go to last year, to last April, he had a, I think, a majority decision win over John Carl Sosa. That was another dull, uninspired performance. You go back before that one to December of 2016, he had a KO1 over Eddie Gomez. So again, it's this up and down with Ellis. Sometimes he looks explosive, he looks great, and then sometimes he just looks kind of uninspired. And I don't know what to think of that. If you're a prospect, you're a prospect that I want to keep an eye on. Sometimes the fights go to distance, man. Styles make fights, and sometimes that's what happens. But when I don't see that desire to, to entertain and, and to do something special that makes people want to see you, when I don't see that from a prospect, that gets me concerned. When I don't see somebody in there working on things, trying new things, when I just see someone kind of going through the motions, and that's kind of what I've seen a couple times from Ellis, that concerns me. We'll see what happens in his next fight. Going with the up and down, expect a TKO three win in Ellis's next fight. That would be my prediction. Saturday, June 30th, there was a Frank Warren card in Belfast, Northern Ireland. I talked about this last week in the preview section. This was picked up by ESPN Plus. Again, I go back to that technology, another app. So those of you who have that app, you saw Michael Conlon improve to 8-0 with five knockouts in his homecoming. This was his first bout back in his homeland since he turned pro. It was an uninspired eight round decision over a Brazilian fighter that uh, wasn't on Conlon's level. Just another thing with, you know, with Conlon, we've seen this a couple times from him. We've seen him look spectacular, exciting, explosive. And then we've seen him just kind of look like he was just going through the motions. Now, the difference with Conlon, he has an ethnic fan base built in. He has a story because of what happened in the Olympics and how he's been promoted by top rank. You know, his pro debut in New York on St. Paddy's Day. Um, I was there, I covered that one live. It was, it, it was an amazing atmosphere for a pro debut. I've never seen anything like it for a pro debut. So he's got that going for him. He can always go back to Northern Ireland and, and do numbers, and he could go to markets like New York or Boston that have a lot of Irish people and do numbers. But very uninspired performance from him. And I just, you know, maybe there was some nerves there because it was his homecoming. I don't know. There were several UK prospects uh, on this, uh, featured on this card. There was a dozen fights on this card. So this was a, a fun one from Frank Warren. No major blockbuster type of fight or anything, but a lot of his young guys, his prospects stayed busy. And you got to do that as a promoter. 
Over here in the USA at the Mohegan Sun Casino in Connecticut, Joe Smith Jr. gets back in the win column, scores a first-round knockout over a fighter from Kentucky. When you think Kentucky, you don't think boxing. And I don't even remember this guy's uh, real name. I just remember his, his moniker. This dude's name, his nickname is the Romantic Redneck. I'm not making this shit up, guys. Look it up. The guy Joe Smith knocked out in like a minute Saturday in Connecticut, his nickname is the Romantic Redneck. I, I, what does, I, none of that has anything to do with boxing. I just, the Romantic Redneck from Kentucky. Well, he had a shot and he lasted about a minute. Okay, uh, the big event though, the big card last weekend obviously was in Oklahoma City. This is what I was talking about a few minutes ago, you know, a hometown card. And this was on ESPN. Not just the ESPN Plus app, but actual ESPN. The co-main stole the show. And the co-main featured the hometown guy, Alex Saucedo, who improved to 28-0 with 18 knockouts. Scores a TKO 7 win over Leonardo Zapavina. Zapavina was knocked down in the third round, but he bounced back in the fourth round and had Saucedo hurt bad. It almost looked like he was going to possibly get him out of there for a second. That turnaround from the third to fourth round, that fourth round might be the, the round of the year. Now, I've heard people talk about this as the fight of the year. I don't know yet if it's the fight of the year. I got to think about it. I got to compare it to some other fights we've seen. Um, for my money, Gassiev, Dortico's, there was just something about that fight, man. And it was just much higher stakes. Um, so... And then even uh, Rungvisaya Estrada, that was just special, special, pound for pound level stuff. So I, I don't know if this is the fight of the year, but it's certainly a freaking candidate. It's going to land in the top three or four uh, candidate this year for fight of the year. It might produce the round of the year, though. That fourth round to see Zapavina come back from being down and, and just he was busted up already. His face was a bloody mess in this fight and to come back and hurt Saucedo the way he did. And for Alex, the hometown kid, to hear his hometown fans pushing him and to feed off that energy to uh, get through that round and come out on the other side of it and stop Zapavina, that was special, man. That was just, it was a hell of an action fight. Zapavina came into this fight with some experience. He had fought Miguel Vasquez in, in Vegas in 2011. He fought Sergey Lipinets in Los Angeles in 2016. So this was no pushover. But he's not a guy that's hard to hit. And he's a guy whose face can bust up a little bit. right? But he can crack. He can punch a little bit. Uh, I'm not saying he's a concussive, you know, one-punch knockout kind of guy. But he can punch a little bit. And he caught Sacedo a few times. So Sado, this was his first step up in class. And what's, what I find interesting, this is his first bout in his hometown since 2014. Top rank is usually really good about building up fighters in their hometowns. Maybe they underestimated Sado and just kind of realized recently, hey, we might have something here that we can build up a little more. But I don't believe he's fought in Oklahoma City since 2014, which doesn't make sense to me. He has before. But he should be fighting there every year. I think he will from here on out. But uh, this, I think they did over 5,000 in attendance for this fight. All things considered, that's a pretty good crowd. So you got 5,000 there in OKC. And you have a Mexican-American from OKC fighting there and putting on this fight of the year contender. That's going to build him up for future business. They could come back to OKC and who knows, Sacedo could be a guy who maybe does 8,000 next, then 10,000. Maybe he could get to where he's doing 12,000 there. You ever think of Oklahoma City as a boxing market? Well, you probably never thought of Omaha, Nebraska as a boxing market either, right? Well, guess what? It is now. And look at what Nico Hernandez is doing in Wichita, Kansas of all places. He's building up something there. In fact, I have a piece on him coming out in the next issue of Ring Magazine. Holla. <laughs> so you guys will have to check that out. Um, so anyway, back to this fight. Punch numbers. So I'll say though, 254 out of 542 for 
Dude landed 47% of his punches. He landed 50% of his power shots. Zapovina, 143 out of 506. 28%. That's not bad. It's not bad. But when you're letting the other dude hit you 47% of the time, that's a big difference. The biggest difference, these guys landed almost the same amount of power punches, I do believe. But Saucedo set his up with the jab. He landed 88 jabs. Zapovina only landed 25. So I got to give some credit here to Carl Moretti. Carl Moretti is top ranks vice president of boxing operations. And I think he has done a really, really good job of keeping top rank relevant as it's, it's you know, being one of the premier promoters in boxing, perhaps the most premier promoter in boxing, definitely in America. I I'd still would consider them the top promoter. And Carl Moretti, he, he's the one who brokered that whole deal with ESPN. That was his thing. And he's got his eye on some of these younger guys. I think it was his idea to bring this fight card to OKC. And you guys got to remember, he used to be the matchmaker for main events. When you think main events back in the day, what's the name that pops up? Arturo Thundergatti, right? So I think Moretti knows when he's got a guy like that. Gotti wasn't from Atlantic City, but he became Atlantic City's son. And he became a, a draw in that market. Do we have a similar situation here with Saucedo? I don't know. I don't think Saucedo is nearly the athlete Gotti was. He doesn't have as good of boxing skills as Gotti was. But he's got the heart, the fire, and he's exciting like Gotti. So I'm not calling him Arturo Gotti. But what I'm saying is Carl Moretti knows something like that when he sees it. So expect them to return to Oklahoma City next year. Now, because Saucedo won this fight, he is now the mandatory for Maurice Hooker, who recently won the WBO Junior Welterweight title. He went over to the UK and won that title against Flanagan, right? So he's from Dallas, Texas. So you got Dallas, you got Oklahoma City. There's a major sports rivalry between those two markets. And it's mostly college football, but that's a pretty heated rivalry. And now you're going to have a fighter from Oklahoma City. According to Bob Arum, it will be this fall. They are willing to go down to Dallas. They are confident enough in Saucedo to go fight the more seasoned, more polished boxer, Maurice Hooker, who just beat a stylist himself. They are willing to go down there to Dallas, fight him this fall, and challenge for that title. So Saucedo's listed as 5'10", he's 24 years old. Hooker's listed as 5'11", 28 years old. In terms of styles, I go back a couple years ago to when Hooker fought Darlis Perez on the Kovalev Ward undercard and had that highly disputed split draw, a fight that he really lost. Can Saucedo tap into some of that and show us something, a, 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 an extra wrinkle, Maybe he got a little careless against Zapavina because he knew what he was in there with. With Hooker, can he deal with that, the slickness, the boxing that Hooker presents? Can he go in there and pressure him and put some leather on him, go to that guy's hometown and win that title? We'll have to see. But I think that's going to be a fun fight if it does happen. And you can expect the Oklahoma City fans to travel down there to Dallas and make that a really, really fun fight atmosphere. I really hope that happens later this fall, and I sure as hell hope it's on ESPN. I hope Top Rank can find a way to make that all happen. I believe Rock Nation, I, I, I know Rock Nation used to represent Hooker. I don't even know if they're in the boxing business right now. So I don't know who's representing Maurice Hooker. But I hope that that fight can be put together this fall in Dallas at a venue that makes sense, on a date that makes sense, and it's on ESPN. Which, by the way, guys, I was out with some friends who were visiting from Los Angeles. We were out in Decatur. It's a, a, a neighborhood in like East Atlanta, watching at a bar. And this card was on most of the TVs in the bar. And it was actually uh, a lot of people were paying attention to the co-main. But holy shit, when that main event came on, everybody went to sleep. Gilberto Ramirez scores a unanimous decision over a Colombian fighter, Romar Alexis Angulo. If you haven't heard about him, don't feel bad. I haven't either. And by the way, neither did Ramirez. 
He defends his WBO super middleweight title for the, I don't know, who cares how many times it's been. It really doesn't matter. He hasn't fought anybody. So now Ramirez is 38-0. Cool. 25 knockouts. Cool. He ruined another card. This wasn't the main event. This should have been the opening card or the opening fight on the card that people could have slept to and got drunk to, had drinks, whatever they're going to do to get ready for the main event. This isn't the first time Ramirez has done this. He fights down to the level of his opposition. Look, on paper, this dude is everything. He's a promoter's dream here in America. He's a Mexican dude who's good looking. He's six foot two. He has a good story to tell. He's articulate. He's a southpaw. And he can box. He's been fighting since he was like 12. He knows how to box. He's got some great natural skills. But he fights down to the level of his opposition. And let's face it, at this point, his best win is over a faded Arthur Abraham to take this WBO title. Head to head right now, I think Benavidez beats him. And I think guy, Callum Smith and George Groves, I'd maybe favor George Groves slightly over him. I, Callum Smith would give him a good challenge. I just, I don't know, man. Maybe he'd show up for those matchups and look different. But I just don't see a fire in this guy's belly, man. And you're fighting an OKC. There is a Mexican-American contingency there. You're going to bring Alex Saucedo back there. So you're trying to get, I understand now why they put Gilberto Ramirez on this card. It makes sense. You keep him busy and everything, but you expose him to this market. It makes sense. But he stunk, he, he, I shouldn't say he stunk the joint out, but did he really inspire anybody? Does anybody want to see this guy again, unless he's in there with another top name? And again, this isn't the first time he's done this, and now he has a title. Also on this card, Heavyweight Trey Lippe scores a TKO3 win. Brazilian, Olympus, uh, Brazilian Olympian Robson Canseco scores a TKO3 win as well. That's it for last week, guys. Let's preview what's coming up this week. All right. This Friday, July 6th at Belasco Theater, downtown Los Angeles. Two days after the 4th of July. I can't believe, man. It's already the 4th of July. You know, I didn't talk about this at the top of this episode, but every year on the 4th of July, I would get on the roof of my building, have drinks with Tiff, sometimes friends would come over, we'd go up to the helicopter pad on the roof, the place where we'd hit mitts and do some sparring and stuff sometimes, and watch all the fireworks. And it was an amazing sight to look out, 360 panoramic view of one of the biggest metropolitan areas on earth, 20 million people in that metro region. Fireworks in every direction. And they'd start, I don't know, some people would start around like 9 p.m. to you know honor the East Coast, New York's um, uh, 4th of July official celebration. But it'd really get popping, of course, later on. But for several hours, fireworks in every direction you can see non-stop until there was a cloud of soot and smoke over the city. Not the best shit to be breathing in, but an amazing sight that no other city I have been to on earth can rival. Just such an amazing sight that I will not get this year because I will be in Atlanta. So I will absolutely freaking miss that. Anyway, wanted to wish all you guys a happy Independence Day, even if you're not American. Celebrate with us. Happy 4th of July, everybody. All right, back to this now. Some 4th of July celebrating at Belasco Theater, downtown Los Angeles. They'll probably just be sweeping up the soot off the street in downtown LA by then, 48 hours later. People in California work very, very slow. Oscar Negrete is headlining a eight round, he's in an eight round fight, coming off that loss to uh, Ray Vargas back in December, his first title challenge. Headlining this Golden Boy Promotions, uh, Friday fight night card. And of course, these are always on Australia TV and they stream live on the internet. Saturday, July 7th, Beibut Shumanov. Remember him? Beibut Shumanov uh, used to hold a title at, I think he might have had two titles, at light heavyweight for a while. Promotes himself. He's uh, putting up a card in Astana, Kazakhstan, promoting it through his company. This is his first bout since 2016. He suffered a very bad eye injury and officially retired in 2017. 
And I guess his eye is miraculously healed because he's fighting again. So uh, good luck to him. I hope that the eye holds up. Um, I, look, I, I know that the ring call is a fighter. You know, you miss it, you itch for it. But man, I hope that eye holds up because you only get two of them, bro. So be safe. Here in the United States, in California, at the Save Mart Arena in Fresno. Again, another hometown card. I'm loving it from top rank. They keep doing this. They're figuring it out. This is on ESPN as well as the ESPN Plus app. I love that they're doing that with some of these cards too. Put it on both platforms. People who have the app, let them get used to using it, but also put it on regular ESPN. Look, man, during the dog days of summer, let, let's give top rank, you know, a little slow clap. They're keeping things alive during the dog days of summer. You might not think these are the best matchups, and I understand that, but there's boxing on TV, and it's on freaking ESPN. So you could go out to a bar and watch this shit. In the main event, Jose Carlos Ramirez, 22-0 with 16 knockouts, going up against Danny O'Connor, the first defense of his WBC junior welterweight title that he won back in March against Samir Mam. He has fought in his hometown. This will be the, the seventh time now. And I talked about Josh Taylor going into the World Boxing Super Series, so I don't think we're going to see Ramirez and Taylor fight anytime soon. Reggie's pro gray. He's fighting in New Orleans in a couple weeks. Those of you who are going to that card, that will also be on ESPN, by the way, I'll see you there. I'm driving down. That's one of the benefits to me being out here. I can make cards like that now that I couldn't make before from Los Angeles. So I'll see you guys down there, man. Um, those of you who are going to be down there, and of course, we'll preview it in a later episodes of TNC, but get at me, you know, in the comments section or on Twitter or something, and let's, uh, let's meet up and talk some boxing, man. So uh, that's the main event. Also, Igadijus Kavaliauskis, I think I said that name correct, 19-0 with 16 knockouts, going up against the Dominican fighter Juan Carlos Ebreu. If he wins this fight, and he should, Kavaliauskis should win this fight, he possibly could fight Terrence Crawford next. That would be pretty interesting, man. Uh, Terrence Crawford, not a whole lot of you know opposition for him in the top-ranked stable at welterweight. But a fight between C Crawford and the Mean Machine, that could be pretty fun, man, in terms of styles. That could be pretty fun. Also on this card, Andy Ruiz, the guy who has a light heavyweight soul trapped in a heavyweight body, kind of a heavyweight body. Andy Ruiz Jr. fighting Kevin Johnson. So since the loss to Joseph Parker back in December of 2016 for that vacant WBO title, he weighed 255 pounds for that fight. He's only fought once since then. Ruiz did not fight in 2017. He fought this March and scored a KO1 win. He was 260 pounds for that win. So I've been hearing all this stuff from his team. Oh, man, we're getting back in shape. We're taking it seriously now. Dude, you were five pounds heavier in your last fight than you were for the title shot that you fought and lost against Parker in 2016. So you're still the same weight you were a year and a half ago, bruh. I'm curious to see what he weighs in for this fight at. I would hope it's 250 or less. But we'll find out. For Kevin Johnson, who they call Kingpin, I, I always thought this guy was extremely overrated. I remember he fought Vitaly Klitschko, and a lot of people were, gonna, were giving him a chance. They really thought he was going to do something. And all he really did was survive. He went all 12 rounds with Vitaly Klitschko, but style-wise, uh, he could survive against Vitaly because Vitaly was so slow. Um, Vladimir would have sparked this guy out of there, just in terms of styles. But he's lost seven of his last 11, turning 39 this year. So to say he's well-fated would be an understatement. He's become a gatekeeper now. So Andy Ruiz should dominate this fight. And down the stretch, I don't know if he'll stop Johnson, but maybe just from an accumulation of punches, maybe he gets him to quit on the stool, gets the corner to throw in the towel, gets the ref to stop it, maybe he cuts him, the doctor stops it. That's what you hope to see from Ruiz. They list Ruiz at like 6'1", I think, 6'1 and a half. He's really like 5'11", and he's just a fat guy. Now, some guys are fat, like Jarrell Big Baby Miller, but they have a big frame. They have big legs, big arms, big shoulders, big back, big chest, right? 
Ruiz is just fat. He has skinny legs, skinny arms, and a massive midsection. I'm not trying to make fun of the guy. I'm just saying it doesn't bode well in boxing. His build, it's much, much better to be somebody who's slender with long limbs. Or if you are a fat guy, if you are chubby, fat, whatever, to be to have the thickness in your legs to generate some punching power or to have the thickness in your back, through your shoulders, through your arms, so you could absorb shots. So, you know, you can use your weight as an advantage against an opponent. For Ruiz, he's, again, I call him a light heavyweight soul trapped in a heavyweight body. This is a guy who throws punches and bunches and everything, but he taps. And his weight isn't in his legs. It's not in his arms or in his shoulders, in his back, where he can use his weight as an advantage. And he's still, as fat as he is, he's 250, which is fat. But against the super heavyweights of today, against the Joshuas and the Wilders and guys like that who weigh almost 250 themselves, but they're tall and lean and muscular and athletic, that weight doesn't help him. The weight did him no favors against Joseph Parker, right? So I just can't take this guy as a serious threat, but because he does throw punches and bunches, he is exciting for a heavyweight. I'm curious to see what he does with Johnson. Johnson could be a real spoiler. I'd love to see Ruiz make a statement against him. All right, guys, that's it. I'm sorry if I triggered any of you who are overweight. I shouldn't have said fat. I should have said overweight. Hashtag triggered. Anyway, happy 4th of July, guys. Be safe. Have fun. Get drunk. Have sex with your girlfriends. Maybe there's a few girls listening here. Have sex with your boyfriends. Have fun, but be safe, all right? I want you guys to be able to tune in to episode 130 of TNC. So celebrate, but don't celebrate stupid. Be safe. Have fun. All right, guys. I'll see you at the fights.